This is a slight change of pace from David, um, uh, uh, from uh, Darren Walters's talk, and my focus in remit is to talk about indirect annular plasty with the Carillon device, which is showing promise primarily in the treatment of functional mitral regurgitation. The two main mechanisms uh, that underpin functional mitral regurgitation include left ventricular dysfunction and left atrial dysfunction, which lead to loss of leaflet coaption. Uh, due to annular dilatation or papillary muscle displacement. Just to focus a little on the mechanism of this, and this is the mechanism of fun functional mitral regurgitation due to left ventricular systolic dysfunction, there are two primary um, uh, forces that drive functional mitral regurgitation. Just to orientate you with this graphic, the left ventricles on top, the, mitral, uh, the left atrium is on the bottom, you can see the mitral valve leaflets there, the cordia and the papillary muscles. First, um, uh, etiology is enhanced tethering forces, which is due to either papillary muscle displacement, so if you've had an old infarct, uh, you get stretching of the papillary muscle, uh, left ventricular dilatation and sphericity and left ventricular dysfunction and annular dilatation. Secondly, uh, you could have depleted or diminished f closing forces <laughs> due to left ventricular contractility impairment, left ventricular dyssynchrony, or papillary muscle dysfunction with reduced annular contraction. And together, functional mitral regurgitation is present in about 60% of patients with uh, heart failure, and you all know that heart failure has a significant um, health care burden. The current medical options for patients with left ventricular dysfunction uh, and severe mitral regurgitation are still limited. Medical management is, uh, is, is central, but often the patients are intolerant of medical therapy or the natural history of their cardiomyopathy progresses uh, beyond, um, and so they may not derive symptomatic or prognostic benefit. Surgery has little or very limited role in patients with severe mitral regurgitation and significant left ventricular dysfunction. Patients with left bundle branch block that have a sufficiently broad uh, QRS complex can undergo cardiac resynchronization therapy, but this is efficacious in only a proportion of patients. We also know that mitral regurgitation grade in this population affects prognosis. And if you look at patients with severe mitral regurgitation and severe left ventricular dysfunction that undergo uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy, those in whom the mitral regurgitation improves have a far better prognosis compared to those in whom the mitral regurgitation remains severe. And this is quite a stark, uh, stark finding. This perhaps suggests that mitral regurgitation in this context uh, is not a bystander, but perhaps an important um, uh, factor that could be modified uh, to improve outcomes. And that's just hypothesis generating rather than, uh, than proven. This is a cross-section of uh, the, the heart, a very simple schematic just to show you uh, where annuloplasty can fit in. This is the left ventricle over here. This is the mit posterior mitral annulus, anterior mitral valve annulus. And I want to draw to your attention the coronary sinus in yellow, which is in close proximity to the posterior mitral valve annulus. And it's this relationship of the coronary sinus to the, uh, the mitral annulus that the Carillon device utilizes to achieve um, its annuloplasty effect. And this is what it is. And unlike what Darren has shown you, this is a very simple device. It compri it's composed of a distal anchor, a proximal anchor, and a nitinol uh, um, a connector or a wire. And it's delivered via this delivery system. This is a sheath and three knobs which un essentially unlock this device in the coronary sinus and allow its anchoring. And the aim is to cinch the mitral annulus by reducing the septal lateral mit uh, mitral annular dimensions. This is the coronary sinus again, posterior mitral annulus. The device is deployed distal end first. Um, the anchor is uh, unfolded and uh, locked in. Uh, tension is then placed on this nitinol um, uh, element um, until the uh, coronary sinus is cinched and the proximal anchor is then deployed. The procedure, unlike uh, other procedures is relatively straightforward. A nine French sheath is inserted into the uh, jugular vein, and this is done. This can be done at a local anaesthetic. The coronary sinus is cannulated. Uh, an angiogram is done of the, cor of the coronary sinus uh, to work out sizing, and the Carillon device is deployed as I as I demonstrated. And I'll show you an animation of the procedure here. It's a 3D animation that helps you appreciate the structure of of the heart, and you can see. Uh, 
um, in blue, the coronary sinus uh, wrapping uh, around the annulus over here, mitral valve uh, leaflet shown here. Uh, the device comes down from above into the coronary sinus. The, the sheath sits in uh, distally as it can go. And then the carillon device is passed till the end of the sheath where the distal anchor is unsheathed. Uh, and you'll see that coming out here. Uh, and by turning the knobs, this uh, sheath is uh, retracted back. You can see the anchors are deployed. There's, there's a slight resheathing process to force lockage of this um, anchor, which allows this to firmly oppose against the wall. And then essentially traction is placed on this nitinol element uh, to draw down on the annulus or cinch the annulus. Uh, and when um, that pre-specified um, pull is achieved, the proximal anchor is deployed uh, and locked. And all of these stages are reversible and retrievable so that if you get any compromise or you're not happy with the result, you can uh, retrieve and uh, remove the device. Now this is the only right-sided device at present that CE Mark to treat functional mitral regurgitation. Uh, it takes usually less than an hour to implant this. There's no need for additional anticoagulant therapy because it's in the coronary sinus. There's no mand mandatory need for general anesthesia, although initial series has been done with general anesthesia. There's no atrial septal defect that needs to be created, and those of you who are familiar with the mitral clip literature would know that the persistence of an atrial septal defect after um, mitral clip therapy is associated with adverse outcomes. And importantly, all treatment, uh, adjunctive treatment options remain op open after this device has been used. So resynchronization therapy, mitral clip therapy can all be deployed. For the next couple of minutes, I just want to share with you the clinical results. It's important for us to appreciate what's uh, um, occurred to drive this technology and the CE marking. Over 500 patients have been treated, and uh, the Germans have been driving a lot of this, uh, the, the, this, this, the, the um, clinical data. The original prospective series are shown here, the Amadeus and the two Titan studies. There have been small iterative changes in the device design between these studies, and a total of 113 patients were studied. These were the classic uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, ischemic dilated cardiomyopathies with significant mitral regurgitation, depressed ejection fraction uh, that were symptomatic. And the endpoints that were measured were 30 day MACE uh, and functional and echo parameters of outcome. Whenever you look at a study, I, I think it's important to look at the background um, characteristics. And th this is a, a rough example of what these functional mitral regurgitation patients look like. They're aged between 60 and 70. Most of them were males, and this is consistent with most cardiology trials, unfortunately, that we, we have a predominance towards males in clinical trials. Uh, more patients are ischemic, and these were highly symptomatic patients in class three or four heart failure with significant LV dysfunction, ejection fractions largely less than 30%, with at least moderate uh, to severe mitral regurgitation in the majority. In terms of safety outcome, there were no safety uh, uh, serious adverse events reported in this trial. There were two deaths in total, and these were related to progression of comorbidities. And I guess the question for us is, did this concept of cinching the mitral valve annulus uh, with an external annuloplasty device achieve its theoretical aims? And the answer is yes. Um, first, it uh, demonstrated a reduction in mitral annular diameter and area, as shown here, in those that were implanted versus those that weren't. And importantly, this, div this observation was seen at one month and was sustained out at 12 months at, at the least. There was a significant reduction in mitral regurgitation, both on volume and vena contractor measurements. And importantly, there was evidence of remodeling at about, uh, reverse remodeling at, at 12 months. And this is an important parameter in, for those of you who treat heart failure patients or monitor heart failure th patients. The uh, presence of reverse remodeling is encouraging and both on um, diameters and volumes, they're encouraging signals for uh, improvement. At one month, there was a, at least a one plus reduction in, uh, in mitral regurgitation grade, which was sustained um, at 12 months. And importantly, and as Darren showed nicely in his video, it's all about the patient and their improvement. And you can see here uh, at one month, a significant improvement in six minute walk, sustained up to two years, and a, a drop in uh, New York heart classification, heart failure by one grade, sustained out to 24 months. Whenever we talk about new devices, uh, the administrators and our colleagues jump up and down and talk about cost, uh, and that causes great anxiety for us. This is a paper published uh, by the Germans, a small paper looking at cost effectiveness in patients with uh, severe mitral regurgitation, um, 
uh, in fun severe functional mitral regurgitation or inoperable, and the relative different therapies that are available. And you can see that Carillon, at least on this small preliminary study, looks favorable in terms of cost, uh, cost effectiveness. So, and of course, whenever you talk about cost effectiveness, you want to talk about efficacy data, and efficacy data means a randomized control trial, and this is the first randomized control trial which is currently been undertaken in Australia and in Europe. Uh, we're over halfway through this, um, this study. And there's some two or three aspects of this study that I'd like to touch on very quickly. The entry criteria listed here, these are very similar to other studies that have enrolled patients. Um, patients are randomized in a three to one ma manner to either device or medical therapy. Now this study is important because both the patient and the assessors are actually blinded to what therapy they've received. So the patient doesn't know whether they actually went home with a Carillon device and the patients that read echoes and assess them don't actually know if the patient has re received nothing, just a coronary sinus injection or not. And the endpoints are regurgitant volume, um, major adverse events, heart failure measurements and echo parameters of uh, LV remodeling. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to share with you a case, and, and, and unlike um, other uh, technologies, the pictures are never that dramatic, but this is a 75-year-old lady that Peter Hansen and I treated about 18 months ago who was in class three heart failure. She had multiple comorbidities and an ejection fraction of 25%, and she was on maximal tolerated medical therapy. This is, um, these are the angiographic images taken from the case, and I just wanted to show you, this is the distal anchor here, the nitinol wire, and the proximal anchor. This is pre-release. Importantly, you can see that there's no compromise of the um, coronary, uh, of the circumflex vessel that runs above. And when the device is released in the same study, same projection, there's no movement showing that this is a very stable uh, position in the coronary sinus. This is what the echo looked like uh, in uh, end of May. Uh, in a parasternal view, you can see there's a significant mitral regurgitation. And um, five months later, I think you can all, you'd all agree that um, the, the mitral regurgitation is impressively reduced and, um, and, and her symptoms were appropriately significantly reduced uh, as well. It's not without its limitations, it's not feasible in all patients because of technical reasons. The coronary sinus dimensions preclude its use in, in a certain proportion of patients. There's a risk of circumflex occlusion. And when you have heavy mitral annular calcification, you can imagine that cinching the mitral annulus is problematic. So to conclude, Mr. Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, the Carillon device is an efficient and safe device. It's, uh, uh, there's no major adverse events reported. Um, it's a short procedural time. It's effective and it produces a, at least a one plus grade reduction in regurgitant volume. There's some evidence of reverse remodeling at one, one year. And there's an imp improvement in functional status, which is durable at least at 24 months. This, of course, is being subjected to a randomized control trial. The device is flexible. There's over 35 uh, device sizes to accommodate differential sizes in sinus anatomy. And importantly, it leaves adjunctive therapy options open, such as mitral clip uh, and chronic resyn uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy. Thank you. Um, although I said we'd take questions at the end, a lot of questions have come through and the one that keeps coming is what do you choose when? And I don't know that we're going to be able to answer that today. But um, Rav, is it true to say that if you've had a mitral clip, you can't then have a transcutaneous mitral valve replacement? I think that would be right. I think da David and, 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 and Darren would be the experts on that, but obviously if you've got a, a clip in situ, I think that limits uh, your percutaneous um, replacement options. And a question that's come through a couple of times, and, and I know Greg and Darren might have part of the answer, the Maverick device that we saw before lunch, which was the one with a bar in the coronary sinus and a tether to a PFO closure device, has that ever been deployed in Australia? And do we know any preliminary results? We've done 11 in Australia. 11 have been done? Of 30 target. Of 30 target? There's been a, there were before the, the Australian ones, there have been about a dozen done in the world, mm -hmm. some of which are about 10 years old now. And do we know whether there have been any ruptures or thromboses? I believe there's been one erosion case. Uh, one erosion? Very early in the piece, and that's yeah. seven years ago. Certainly in our local experience, no. And thrombus hasn't been a problem with that string? No, 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 no not at all. In fact, dual antiplatelets, that's all. 
So dual antiplatelets and no problems with thrombus. So just to summarise for the streaming sites, no problems with insertions in Australia. How long does it take roughly to do a maverick? Between 15 and 17 days. Okay, so about the same as the Carolyn. All right, so we will come back and discuss triaging of what you do when, but uh, there were those couple of questions about repair and the number of Carolyns that have been done in Australia. I think we're, we're probably just over a dozen. Um, because of the various competitor technologies available to treat functional mitral regurgitation, enrolment has been difficult because there's multiple devices uh, that are available and so choice has been a problem and we're trying to encourage enrolment in appropriate trials and that I guess is, is what's limiting experience. Yeah, and no, everyone knows that since Simplicity 3, the renal denervation trial that was placebo controlled, almost every device like this needs a sham control arm, which is not always very easy yes. for, for doctors or patients to accept.